Thank you, Grand Paul Mark Shelton and Ms. Daniels of Black Health Matters for the introduction and for the invitation to join you today. I am so pleased to be with you, even if today you'd have just the virtual me. I look forward to a day when we can meet in person. I am grateful for the work you do to improve the state of black health in America. I know you have been holding these annual summits for years now, bringing much needed attention to chronic conditions such as diabetes and heart disease, educating black men about prostate cancer, and bringing awareness to mental health issues and lesser known diseases like multiple myeloma. You and I both know the disproportionate impact of these diseases on black Americans. And we know that when you share information about prevention and treatment within your communities, you are not just making a difference, you are saving lives. I'm so grateful for all you do. I was honored to receive your invitation to speak and eager for the opportunity to engage with you. I know you have wide-reaching influence, not just among your fraternal brothers, but also with a broader audience that trusts and looks to you, not to me, to tell them the truth about matters of health in the black community. I want to join you in these vital conversations, conversations that are so critical to our ability to ensure everyone in this country can be healthy, and conversations that will help us get through the COVID-19 pandemic. We have made great progress in the fight against COVID-19, and while I'm not yet ready to declare victory, I am cautiously optimistic we are on the path to a more normal world, or shall I say, an even better normal world. As each week passes, as we work towards vaccinating the entire country one by one, the number of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths continues to decline. I hope that you are vaccinated because if you are, you are protected and able to begin enjoying many of your favorite activities again. I also know that there are still many in your communities who are not vaccinated. We wanna work with those who have not yet been vaccinated to understand why. Is it because of concerns about the scientific process and the speed of the development of these vaccines? Is it concerns about side effects? Are there concerns about access? Is it because of not knowing where to get a vaccination or not having transportation to get there? Is it a concern about taking unpaid time off from a job? We are working to engage trusted messengers and community leaders like all of you to address these questions, to provide assistance where possible and to help us understand why people are hesitant. And we are working with small and large business owners and community organizations to make it as easy as possible for everyone to receive their vaccine. We and so many community-based organizations are doing this hard work because every vaccine in an arm is a win. You can help us by sharing the message that getting vaccinated gets us back to the life we want to enjoy. It is the best way to defeat the virus and get back to everyone gathering at weddings, sports events, and travel. Everyone in the U.S. ages 12 and older is eligible to get vaccinated. Vaccines are free and available at a location near you. Getting vaccinated has never been easier or more convenient. I'd like to tell you the story of how I came to public health. You may not know that I was a young resident physician in the 1990s at the height of the HIV AIDS crisis. At the time, AIDS was a death sentence, a mysterious disease that medicine had few answers to and no treatment for. My desire to heal my patient's suffering, but without the tools to do so, and the disparity in the way the disease was affecting communities of color, were the genesis of my decision to choose a career in infectious diseases and public health. The issues of racial and ethnic disparities in health have been around for centuries through generations of Americans. The healthcare community and public health have been sounding the alarm for years about the barriers to healthcare, such as poverty, poor housing, unsafe and unhealthy environments, and lack of access to good jobs, quality education, and healthcare. Few outside of medicine and public health hurt us. And then COVID-19 came along and pulled back the curtain for all the world to see. The national movement of racial justice includes the understanding that we cannot be healthy as a nation until everyone has access to healthcare.
At CDC, we have long recognized that racism is the root cause of many health disparities. The challenge is driven by structural factors, racism, discrimination, and historical disenfranchisement overwhelmingly impact communities of color, people with disabilities, members of the LGBTQ community, women, individuals who are incarcerated and without homes, or those who live in rural or frontier settings. They produce barriers which can dictate where a person lives, where they work, where their children play, and where they gather as a community. And they can have lifelong negative consequences on the mental and physical health of those affected. Those consequences are reflected in data, such as the higher rates of chronic diseases, like diabetes, hypertension, obesity, asthma, and heart disease, in some racial and ethnic minority groups. They are reflected in the staggering disparities in life expectancy lost due to COVID-19. 0.8 years for whites, 1.7 years for Latinos, and an astounding 2.9 years for black Americans. The consequences are evident in increased risk for HIV or maternal mortality in Black and Hispanic or Latino communities. COVID also showed us that these inequities put every one of us at risk. The health and strength of our nation, our economic strength and the strength of human potential is diminished by these long-standing inequities. A recent analysis estimates that disparities amount to approximately $93 billion in excess medical care costs and $42 billion in lost productivity per year, leaving aside the losses due to premature deaths. Many black Americans working in what we consider essential jobs did not have the luxury of working from home, separating from their families, or taking time off from work when they got sick. That, coupled with the increased rates of chronic conditions that can put one at higher risk for COVID-19, created a perfect storm of events that led to disproportionate impact in communities of color. My deepest sympathies to all of the families who have lost loved ones to this deadly virus. I came to this job at CDC with a lifetime of experience as a physician, as a woman of faith, a mother, and a wife who has witnessed firsthand the uneven impacts of health disparities. I bring my passion and advocacy for health equity to my role as director of the agency charged with protecting the health of all Americans. At CDC, we are embarking on an agency-wide strategic process that will make sure that health equity is central to the work we do. As I often say, I want us to take this work and bake it into the cake such that every center, every division, every program is advancing these efforts. Through this work, we will holistically transform the way we approach public health within the agency, across the nation, and across the world. This new initiative will be at the core of what we do and is aptly named our core strategy. CORE consists of four key pillars with separate but coordinated objectives. First, the C, to cultivate comprehensive health equity science. The O, to optimize interventions. The R, to reinforce our partnerships. And finally, the E, to enhance our capability and workforce. To tackle some of the drivers of health inequities, we are making new and expanded investments in racial and ethnic minority communities and other disproportionately affected areas around the country. We are putting $3 billion into communities nationwide to support local efforts to increase COVID-19 vaccine uptake by those disproportionately affected by the pandemic. We also awarded $2.25 billion to address COVID-19 related health disparities among racial and ethnic minority groups and people living in rural areas. And we put another $300 million towards strengthening the work of community health workers nationwide in local efforts to prevent and control COVID-19 among high-risk populations and communities hardest hit by the pandemic. These investments are about more than COVID-19. They are about establishing an infrastructure for equitable public health in the future. They are about ensuring that public health workforce is trained and comes from the diverse communities they serve. After a long, hard 18 months, we are finally turning the corner on the worst public health crisis of our lifetime. Think about that. From the start of the pandemic to now, we have made tremendous strides in understanding, treating, and now preventing a completely novel virus.
Science, hard work, and yes, prayer, has brought us to the point where we have endured and where we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you for your help in getting us there. Please encourage anyone you know who has not been vaccinated to get vaccinated. That is how we will win the battle with COVID-19, and that is how we will build the structure we need to ensure we can all be healthy now and in the future. Thank you.